Hello, I'm Mr. Eliason, and welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to continue discussing westward settlement, talking about this new concept that's been sort of floating around, right sort of on the edge of our narrative all this time, this idea of manifest destiny. So we're going to talk about manifest destiny and the role to which westward expansion played a significantly important role, a significantly increased role in American history in the uh, moving forward from the 1840s. So only two objectives for today. Take a moment and make sure you understand them. And let's dive in and talk about westward expansion and manifest destiny. So the phrase manifest destiny was coined by John O'Sullivan. This idea that uh, the United States, it's our God-given right to expand westward. Uh, John O'Sullivan was a newspaper article, or report, sorry, a newspaper uh, editor and writer who uh, coined the phrase manifest destiny and then further expanded on it in his seminal, es uh, seminal essay, The Great Nation of Futurity. So I'll give you just a moment to read this and then we'll move forward. The basic idea here is that the United States needs to continue to expand west, that because of the values that we held up during our founding, that the United States is inherently worthy of moving west and taking over new territory, bringing with us the light of civilization in contrast to the despotism of the Spanish colonies or of Europe or of all these other groups. So the American eagle here needs to stretch out her wings and probably needs more room for her tail. Therefore, we should continue to push westward. The government had pushed policies that helped this through a series of preemption laws. Uh, we, didn't we didn't really talk about this during the Tyler administration, but the Tyler administration passed what's called the Preemption Act, which allowed people who were legally squatting, who were illegally squatting on land, to legally purchase it from the U.S. government, further sort of uh, creating this informal system that we could settle new territories in Iowa, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, these areas. This would, of course, lead to conflict with Native American groups and eventual and continuous uh, pushback. But this has also been one of the central themes of the class. So none of that should be surprising to us. What we also start seeing in this period, and then also later as the frontier starts to close, we start getting these ideas that the frontier provides an equalizing force in American history that it provides a pressure valve. So if people, uh, if there's too much competition in the East or people don't see a path to success, they can move out and through their own rugged individual spirit, go and establish themselves on new land. They can improve that land. And then the act of doing that equalizes opportunity and helps provide the sort of framework for American democracy. And also this idea of the American dream that anyone can come to the United States and succeed based on their own individual effort. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner is the guy who most, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner is the guy who popularized this frontier thesis. But here's John O'Sullivan in The Great Nation of Futurity explaining sort of the future of the United States. So take a moment to pause and read and we'll continue to move forward. All of this helped to uh, pave the way for what's called Oregon fever. Oregon, the Oregon Territory, as you hopefully remember, was potentially claimed by Lewis and Clark when they found uh, when they found the mouth of the Columbia River in their expedition way back in Unit Three, or uh, the early Unit Four. This land was potentially, was maybe claimed by the United States. England also had a claim to it and Spain had a claim to it. And as you remember, in the rush Bagot Treaty, we established joint ownership of this territory with England. Trails were established across this territory during this time period and then afterwards. And the massive economic cataclysm that was the Panic of 1837 also was one of the huge push factors leading to both skyrocketing prices in Western land because of the speculative bubble, a sharp contraction of credit from the bank failures, and then high levels of unemployment in urban areas because of the economic panic. And so what is this, uh, what is this poor former, formerly middle class person to do once he loses everything? Well, he could set out west to hopefully settle Oregon territory. So those are the push factors for Oregon fever, but there's also some pull factors. A report called the Wilkes Report, which was an army officer, sort of painted this incredibly rosy picture of Oregon territory. And we started establishing settlements uh, in the Williamette Valley, sort of uh, moving in to the Columbia River Valley area in what is today Oregon. And so this report of this amazingly fertile land that would provide, uh, you know, amazing, you know, we could grow tons of crops and it would be very easy to live on and all that. And, you know, awesome narwhals. 
uh, led people to was the were the pull factors that pulled people out to Oregon Territory. And so you get a whole bunch of settlers moving westward across the quote unquote Oregon Trail leading from Independence, Missouri, all the way across the Rocky Mountains, and then out to the Columbia River Gorge and the Columbia River Valley. These, uh, these new Conestoga wagons that had grown in popularity in the 1800s were relatively cheap and allowed people to move across the country in convoys. And so we got a steady stream of settlers moving across this Oregon Trail and then settling on the West Coast. The Oregon Trail is just one of the trails moving westward. The Santa Fe Trail was also an important one, as was the Mormon Trail going through Salt Lake City. All of these trails would further connect the east to the west, both providing a path for settlers to go out west, but also providing a flow of goods from the more industrialized areas of the east out to the sort of hinterlands of, uh, on the west, along the west coast. And so all of these trails led American settlers to start moving into Mexican territory and jointly occupied Oregon country. And so we started to see a large influx of, of American settlers to these territories that may or may not be controlled by the United States. The journey westward was often relatively difficult for a lot of these settlers. Uh, finding adequate food supplies, uh, finding uh, safe water was problematic, uh, dysentery and other uh, sort of diseases that you get from, from drinking uh, unclean water were very common. And uh, there was often, if you lost sight of the trail or tried to blaze your own trail, you could end in disaster. Famously, the Donner Party purchased a map of a quote-unquote shortcut across the, across the Rocky Mountains, and they were, they were then trapped in a box canyon and in the end had to resort to cannibalism until they were finally rescued. And so the Donner Party represents some of the hardships suffered by these, these emigrants as they moved out west. This, of course, also led to conflict with Native Americans. There were a number of rounds of Native American warfare out west that followed basically the same pattern in that there's some as increasing amounts of settlement. First, Native Americans, for the most part, coexist with the new settlers. Then as the pop as the uh, white population rises, there's conflict with Native Americans. Uh, there's fighting on both sides. Native Americans uh, launch large scale attacks and then eventually are defeated, forced to concede territory and move west. We'll spend much more time with these Western groups of Native Americans in our next unit. So just keep in mind, Native Americans out there, similar pattern. Yeah. For the election of 1844, westward expansion and westward uh, settlement was the key issue. The Whig Party is going to nominate Henry Clay, thinking that uh, this is probably their best chance to take back control over the White House. Uh, obviously, the Tyler administration was not particularly uh, effective in any way and uh, with uh, the constant vetoes. And so Henry Clay is finally going to run for himself, the whole like putting up a figurehead and then hoping to rule from the shadows thing having failed. The, the Democratic Party is going to really struggle to choose a candidate. Uh, Van Buren's going to run again. Uh, you've got the shadow of Jackson looming over everything. There's a number of other uh, candidates uh, that are trying to get the Democratic ballot. And so a split Democratic Party is going to go through a whole bunch of different nominating votes before eventually settling on James K. Polk the former Speaker of the House, and, uh, and you know, a more or less a political unknown up to this point. I mean, that's not totally true. He was very influential in the House of Representatives, but he had not really expressed any major political ambitions. He grudgingly accepted the nomination and said that if he was elected, he would only serve for one term. So James K. Polk is going to be the Democratic nominee, and Henry Clay is going to run for the Whigs. Here they are as roosters fighting. The two issues were, one, Oregon Territory, uh, James K. Polk pushed for the most aggressive response to the uh, joint occupation area, and so uh, was demanded that the United States be ceded all of Oregon territory up to the 54th 40 parallel with the uh, slogan, 54 40 or fight, or all of Oregon or none of it, basically arguing that he would uh, push for the greatest amount of territory seized. So uh, he becomes known as the Manifest Destiny President on account of his advocacy for massive amounts of territorial grabs in the West. And then there was the Texas issue. James K. Polk came out in favor of the annexation of Texas. Henry Clay did his best to try to totally avoid the issue and refuse to discuss Texas at all, believing that he would alienate one of the two constituencies, either alienate the North if he pushed for the annexation of Texas, or alienate the South if he came out against the annexation of Texas. And so Henry Clay decided to try to basically sit on the fence and refuse to talk about the issue, where 
On the other hand, James K. Polk strongly advocated for the annexation of Texas. And so this political cartoonist believed that by doing that, Henry, but James K. Polk was falling in a hole and that by advocating for Texas, he would not be able to get to the White House. So take a moment and pause and read this, uh, the, the, read some information about this campaign. It's another ridiculous campaign where you see slanderous account, slanderous uh, statements thrown about that have very little about, very little connection to reality. So pause and take this one in. And then let's move on. So your end result is this. Obviously, James K. Polk wins. We're seeing now a much larger Liberty Party here. And what ends up happening is the Liberty Party plays spoiler in the key state of New York. Henry Clay loses the election by not coming out strongly against the annexation of Texas because the Liberty Party, uh, this leads a whole bunch of abolitionists in the Liberty Party to vote for James Burney, who then flips the state of New York to Polk. And so his inability to discuss or unwillingness to discuss slavery costs Henry Clay the election because the 36 electoral votes from the Polk got from New York, had they been flipped to Clay, would have changed the results of the election. And so the Liberty Party plays spoiler. And instead, now we're definitely going to annex Texas. And so here's Henry Clay falling into Salt River, which was a metaphor for political defeat at the time. And the cause of abolition also floating right there in political defeat as Texas sails into the country and welcomed by James K. Polk. So here's, uh, here's the question of Texas. We'll take a moment to pause and uh, read this. And obviously, the annexation of Texas is going to lead to some significant issues going forward. Namely, it's going to basically necessitate war with Mexico, which we'll talk about next time. And James K. Polk, not wanting to go to war with England and Mexico at the same time, immediately goes back on his promise. And we do the totally rational thing, extending the 49th parallel all the way out and dividing Oregon territory in half. So Polk did immediately betray Northerners by not pushing for his uh, massive 54-40 year fight promise. But at the same time, we're fighting, we're now going to be fighting a war with Mexico. So fighting a war with England at the same time, probably not smart. So we'll, for, to, for tomorrow, we'll start talking more about the preparations for war. As far as other Polk's domestic policy, in order to help finance the war, we're going to create something called the Independent Treasury, which are a series of interconnected state banks. So it's not a national bank, but it is greater interconnectedness between the regional state banks. We're going to see a decrease in the tariff, which in general is going to uh, which, which is going to spur massive amounts of imports and is going to still lead to significant amounts of revenue. So even a lower tariff, because this means so many more goods are imported, is going to lead to more revenue. But we're going to still going to see the American system vetoed and Henry Clay's ambition to connect the country together with federal funds is not going to come to fruition. So there's uh, that brings us to a close for today. Hopefully you can answer these questions in some detail. And when we come back tomorrow, we'll talk about the aftermath of all of this and the war with Mexico. Thank you for listening.